Uh, so my name is uh, Megan Wax, and I'm the VP of Engineering at uh, Sci5, which is a company founded by the creators of RISC V, the free and open ISA. So the ISA is basically a standard for how um, computers talk and how they um, speak in binary. So the RISC V ISA is an open standard that's uh, maintained by the RISC V Foundation um, to maintain the standard and publish it and make sure that the, uh, the RISC V name is sort of used consistently for uh, implementations that comply to the standard. How many companies are using RISC-V? Uh, it's kind of unknown because they don't have to declare usage or anything, but there are hundreds of uh, member organizations in the RISC-V Foundation, of which are companies and academic institutions and um, individual members as well. So it's hard to say how many companies are using RISC-V because they don't have to say. So when I first joined Sci-5, uh, I was one of like five engineers, and I kind of did everything. So every time we hire someone, I get to do one less job, and it's very exciting. And now we've got um, you know hundreds of employees. And so my day-to-day -day, uh, currently is really uh, making sure our customers stay happy, um, dealing with uh, issues that come up with the customers, kind of making sure that we are delivering what they want. And a lot of that involves uh, making changes in open source code and managing teams to make those changes and really trying to spread my knowledge to the company <laughs> since I've been there for a while. Uh, okay, so Sci-Fi's uh, business is really um, uh, mass customization and faster time to market. So we provide customizable CPU cores that are running the RISC-V ISA. And what that means is uh, customers who want to build a chip, uh, they need a CPU core. And it's just like the code that describes how a CPU functions. And so we provide that to customers and they integrate it onto their own chips. And this is a pretty common uh, business model that uh, companies sell core IP, but we're using RISC V and it's highly customizable. And then we also, for customers who don't already know how to build a chip, I don't have all the teams to build that, and they just have an idea of what they want a cool chip to do, uh, can come to us and we will uh, uh, leverage our platform to design custom chips as well. I, there's no hard minimum for how many a customer needs to request. We're open to anything depending on how close it is to something that we have. Um, uh, again, we're trying to do things in a sort of reusable um, way. We have a platform that we design to, and um, therefore it makes it faster and easier for customers to kind of get something custom because they can uh, leverage the power of everything we've done before. We never do anything as a one-off. Customizable CPU core is really talking about like what makes a it's a kind of a trade-off between performance and area um, for, that's appropriate for your application. So you might have a deeper pipeline or a shallower pipeline. So to get your, your achievable frequency higher, you might have more or less cache memory. You might have more or less uh, instructions that you support natively in the hardware, such as multiply instructions or floating point or uh, atomic instructions. Um, it doesn't. It's not necessarily like what else is on the S SOC when we're selling the core IP. It's not um, how many UARTs do you have or how many um, GPIOs do you have. Though we are um, looking forward to adding more and more kind of to the CPU offering. Um, so the way that we code, um, the way that we design hardware, most of the industry designs hardware is in a language called Verilog. And this is a language that is um, designed, it describes hardware very well. It describes wires and registers and clocks and what happens when you get clock edges. And so the industry is used to receiving um, Verilog files that describe a processor and instructions on how to like constrain them inside their design, like what kind of timing constraints they need and stuff like that. And they're used to accept, uh, receiving like a test bench and test cases, which would be like C programs or software that would run on this uh, code in simulation. So there's tools that can simulate Verilog. Um, we actually do our development in a language called Chisel, which is Scala-based language. But when we deliver to customers, we deliver them Verilog, because that's what they're used to working with. But we get the configuration power from the Chisel language, and then we give them something that's tailored exactly to what they want. Uh, first of all, uh, the RISC-V ISA is highly uh, scalable and configurable. So things like the vector extension um, is vector extension and other proposed extensions are uh, kind of addressing some of the things that you would need a custom accelerator for. But in addition to that, uh, the RISC-V ISA makes it really easy to have a CPU that's simple and interfacing with a custom accelerator. It doesn't necessarily have to speak the RISC-V language. It can be memory map interface. 
um, or have its own uh, language, but the RISC-V core can provide management and kind of orchestrate to that accelerator rather than having to come up with some other CPU or trying to build that stuff into this kind of more complex accelerator. Um, so sci-fi really envisions like a world where you have something cool you want to do and you get a, you know, a whole infrastructure around it to support your custom thing that you want to do. The goal of the RISC-V ISA is a very modest one, which is to be the ISA for everything. And I think we're on our way to that. Um, it's kind of taken over all the lower end uh, microcontrollers. A lot of the companies who sell core IP have switched to RISC-V because there's no point in selling something that only they maintain. So that's already happening. And I think what we're seeing now is RISC-V advancing into the higher end processor space. So you're going to get Instead of just embedded, um, small embedded processors, you're going to get like big systems with really powerful processors that are still speaking the rest five language, but kind of going into areas that people might not be expecting. Yeah. Um, so things like uh, server farms and infrastructure places, um, infrastructure type locations, um, AI, machine learning. Um, yeah, basically places where you think of kind of the workhorse of computing, not the like leap IoT type stuff. I'm really excited about um, the, I mean, RISC-V has just gotten big so much faster than I think anyone thought. I thought, like Sci-Fi, I think, thought we would have to work harder to make it real, and it's just happened a lot faster than we thought. So I'm really excited to see kind of what people start doing with this. It's not anymore like should we use RISC-V or not, it's just like, okay, we're going to use 5, we're going to use RISC-V, so what else are we going to do with it? Like the processor is kind of, I mean, I hate to say this, but hopefully it will become kind of commodity and it's all about what are you going to do with it and um, yeah, so I'm excited to see where people go and I think it's really awesome, uh, everything like, you know, I see people at Hackaday conference like learning about this stuff and hacking on FPGAs and it's really exciting to see kind of the proliferation of the open source tools going all the way down from Verilog also to the synthesis tools. I think that's something I hope to see a lot more of in the next five years. I think that the tool chains themselves should not be perceived as a threat. I think it's making it easier for people to use your stuff. I mean, time and time again, like, software world has shown that open source is an effective way to do software development. And regardless of your philosophy about whether you should be able to modify things, like, it's just a good way to get work done. And it kind of, I think it will get rid of a lot of waste in bad tools. And I think if you have a lot more people working on tools, they just get better. And so I think the FPGA companies should be excited of having more people people looking at their tools, improving their tools, and like targeting things for their hardware. So I, I don't think it's a threat. I don't think their product is their tools. Their product is their hardware. And so more, the more uh, software that can target their hardware, I, I think it's better for them.